Okay. Oh, we didn't tell you we were recording. Is that okay? <laughs> totally fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So if anyone um, needs captions, please turn them on at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then if there are any unmet access needs, please DM me, Greta, or Katie in the chat. Welcome to Cozy. I'm so glad you guys are all here today. Um, I'm Greta Treisman, she, her, I'm a faculty librarian at Seattle Central College. COSY stands for Conversations on Social Issues. Central has been hosting COSY Talks since Occupy Wall Street landed literally on Central's campus in 2011. We see it as a library's role in the institution to provide space and resources to explore all kinds of ideas and topics. This is a place to grapple with ideas that we may not have encountered and be curious about how we fit them into our lives and our communities. These discussions will not be comfortable to all members of our community, and we ask that you all sit in some discomfort with us. This is the kind of discomfort that means we are learning and growing together. So Cozy took a short break over the last year, but Katie and I felt that current geopolitical events, the genocide in Gaza, warranted bringing it back for the special Palestine series. Uh, we know we are taking on a charged topic for this series. And we realize that there are a lot of our community members with differing thoughts and feelings about Gaza, Palestine, and Israel. We also know that many in our community are coming to this topic with a hunger to understand the history of what is happening right now in Gaza. We're choosing to center Palestinian experiences and ideas for the series because Palestinian voices have been generally marginalized in our mainstream media and systems of power. So we have some uh, principles, for our cozy agreements, which Katie has dropped into the chat. If you want to take a look at those, um, that would be great. And the chat is going to lim be limited during this presentation part of the session. So you can send chats to the co-hosts, me and Katie, um, during the presentation. And then after it's op op over, we will open the chat so you can add comments and questions to everyone. Please use chat th thoughtfully and respectfully. When the Q&A discussion part of the session starts, please raise your digital Zoom hand when you want to speak. And we'll be using progressive stacking today. So we'll be taking questions from students and members of the community who have Palestinian heritage first, um, just moving those up to the top of the queue. So if you hold either of those identities, um, you can rename yourself with an asterisk in front of your name and we'll move your question up. And let us know if you'd like any help with this. Okay, finally. So today we have Dr. Amy Hagopian with us as a guest. Dr. Hagopian is Professor Emeritus in Public Health at the University of Washington. She conducts academic work on how the maldistribution of power and wealth undermines health. She taught a class on war and health for nine years at the UW and led a team to measure war-related mortality in Iraq in 2011. She also taught a class on homelessness with an emphasis on causes and consequences of living unsheltered. She serves as vice chair of the editorial board of the American Journal of Public Health and received the APHA's Sidel Levy Award for Peace in 2018. She's incoming chair of APHA's International Health Section, active in APHA's Peace Caucus, and a leader in the Global Alliance on War, Conflict, and Health. Welcome, Amy. Please take it away. Oh, thank you so much. What a nice introduction. Um, and nice to see you all here. Let's see, we have 35 people in the room. That's lovely. Nice cozy group, um, so to speak. Uh, and I'm going to talk with you today about a paper that uh, I co-authored with my colleague Osama Tanous, uh, which is forthcoming shortly in the International Journal of Social Determinants of Health and Health Services. So um, Dr. Tanous is a pediatrician, a real doctor <laughs> uh, in Haifa, Israel. So he's one of those rare uh, Palestinians with some privilege because they live in Israel and they have to contend with all the conflicts, uh, internal and external associated with that identity. Um, I have been in contact with him regularly throughout this latest episode and can share some of my interpretations of his thoughts on this. But uh, he was doing a fellowship in, at Emory University a couple, few, three years ago and asked, would I be uh, a collaborator on a project? And we decided to talk about homelessness and how it manifests differently in the United States and in Palestine. 
uh, and we ended up writing this paper together. He came to Seattle and visited various ways in which we manage homelessness in our city. Uh, and so it was just a wonderful interaction. Also, last summer, I had the privilege of traveling to Palestine to uh, work on a course where I have been uh, on the advisory team. Um, it, it was a Harvard-sponsored course uh, on Palestinian history and public health. Uh, and it had about a third US students, a third students from the West Bank, and a third were students from Gaza. Uh, so it was quite a remarkable gathering. And of course, the Gaza students wouldn't normally be allowed out of Gaza to attend something like this. So they got the World Health Organization to intervene and get them special permission to attend. And we conducted various field trips in the course of that. We went to uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron uh, and um, Haifa, not Haifa. Uh, for these names, sorry, I have trouble. I'll think of it and we'll come up with it. Um, so these field trips were very instructive in terms of how people get treated differently when they arrive at checkpoints. Uh, so, you know, we had a bus full of this mixed bag of people and my colleague who is a US citizen teaching in Florida who was on the faculty of this class, for example, uh, had Palestinian family roots. So she got treated as a Palestinian, whereas others of us from the United States got to stay on the bus with our passports. She had to get off and navigate the border, this checkpoint on foot with the students. So I learned a lot from that trip. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna dive into this talk. I'm gonna start with some discussion of how homelessness manifests in the United States, specifically Seattle, which is where we're from. Um, and uh, I'll just say most of the photos that I show today, unless it's obvious, um, I took them uh, with permission when there are people in them. Uh, often there are not. Uh, I also want to say that, uh, just to be clear, I have never been homeless myself and want to acknowledge that positionality. Um, Seattle is thought to be home to the third largest unhoused population in the United States after New York and Los Angeles. So it's an important place to study this problem. All right, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, any of you who live in Seattle know how when you drive down the street, homelessness looks to you. Um, the city of Seattle, as you know, maintains a complaint line. You can call the find it, fix it line and complain about homelessness. That's a very useful activity to engage in. Uh, and when you complain, you are mostly calling to say, there's a tent encampment near me and I would like it removed. And uh, more than 29,000 homelessness-related complaints were made to the city of Seattle over the last year or so. Um, the dots on this map are in relative size to the size of the encampment. Uh, I don't know how many of you in the room read the Real Change newspaper, uh, which is the street newspaper sold by very low-income and homeless folks in our city, a fantastic project. And uh, they have a reporter named Guy Oren, who is just a brilliant journalist and put together this uh, depiction of our homeless encampments. It's really remarkable sometimes, uh, and we've studied the location of these complaints in relation to actual encampments mapped by uh, outreach workers. And it is remarkable how many people up here in Northeast Seattle and up here um, have called in complaints about encampments when actually the relative number of real encampments in their neighborhoods is much smaller than you would think from the complaints lodged. Okay, um, so you all know uh, the concept of the dominant narrative, the master narrative, the, the stories we tell ourselves about why things are the way they are in this country. Um, and the dominant narrative is one of those things that 
persists regardless of the facts and the evidence often. Um, and you don't even notice that it's the dominant narrative. It's like fish swimming in water. They don't have any concept that there's water. It's just what they're in and what it looks like to them. So uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about how the dominant narrative gets manufactured, um, but uh, a, couple, a year and a half or so ago at the 45th Street entrance to the freeway, I noticed this bit of graffiti uh, put up there by some very helpful person who wanted to be sure we understood that the people standing there collecting cash for their survival uh, were going to immediately go use that to buy drugs. Uh, and the, that, of course, was deserving of shame and humiliation because only housed people should be able to buy drugs and alcohol, which are sold legally in our city, right? Um, Okay, so uh, I came up with this little uh, conceptual framework for how we think about homelessness in our city and the various organizational types that address homelessness. And maybe this is too small for you to see very well, but the important thing here is um, how you or your organization views the causes of homelessness. So there's a whole body of groups who think homelessness is largely driven by unfortunate behavior choices, drug use, failure to get a job, mental health problems, criminal behavior. Just generally, these are bad people. They made poor choices and now we're all stuck with the unsightliness of their manifestation in homelessness. And as you move down the ladder here in my conceptual framework, there's also these organizations that work to organize homeless people themselves in mutual aid projects like Tent City or Nicholsville. Um, I'm not talking about the Low Income Housing Institute, which organizes uh, tiny house villages, but that's done as a charitable project. And you know, charity is a nice thing, but it's not aimed at changing how the world works. It's aimed at palliative care, keep, keeping people comfortable while they navigate the horrors of the world. Um, recently, Facebook, which for some mysterious reason knows me really well, um, forwarded me a uh, invitation to join a group called um, uh, Late, late, horrors of late stage capitalism uh, reframed as heartwarming stories. And there are so many of these in our landscape. And once you have that idea in your head, you will see them everywhere. But charity is about turning this horror into a heartwarming story, right? It's not aimed at changing how power works and how people get into these situations. So that's my little framework. You're welcome to uh, ask me for it. I can send it to you. Um, I really like conceptual frameworks that where you map out how you think something happened so that you can choose a place to intervene. Um, and so all these Places, these influencers, news, family and friends, street observations, these places where the dominant narrative gets manufactured, uh, feed public attitudes towards homelessness, which feeds into how public officials and policymakers view homelessness, uh, which drives the laws, the budgets, the policies, um, and uh, produces homelessness. Um, Advocates can intervene in various ways, uh, but it's important to think about if you wanted to change how this works, where would you intervene? So here's an organization uh, that helps drive the dominant narrative called Change Washington. Does anybody subscribe to their emails or heard of them or interact with them? Uh, for some reason, I'm on their email distribution list, which is sort of every week there's a new horror. Um, but they have a website, you can go there. You know, this is a photo from their website. Uh, you know, 
the craven addict homeless person. Uh, Seattle's safety is in the hands of the city council. Make your voice heard today. So they were all about recriminalizing drug use um, so that we could put people in jail. And it's amazing to me, they were successful. We did recriminalize. And yet I live a few blocks from 12th and Jackson, which is sort of where there is open air drug dealing and not a single thing changed. There are still, I mean, when you go there, it's just this hotbed of despair. You know, just misery, unhappiness, uh, mental illness in full display. Nobody's helping these people at all. They're just on their own on this street corner trying to survive. Uh, so these are the folks who are all about driving this narrative and who helped get the new conservative group of folks elected to our city council. Um, people have noticed there's an ax murderer who was on the loose for a while who killed two homeless people with an ax. Uh, and I'll just say people like that are given the idea, are empowered, are somehow justifying their behaviors because of how we calculate and create this dominant narrative. So when we dehumanize people, there are consequences because people in our community will seize onto those ideas and impose their own punishments for this bad behavior. Do people follow the union gospel mission and they have ads constantly in the Seattle Times. This is an ad in the Seattle Times, empty, fulfilled. It's such an odd ad, isn't it? Um, so Union Gospel Mission lo locates itself downtown and they do charitable care for homeless people as long as they're willing to attend the church services and participate in the evangelical project of the Union Gospel Mission. Um, so, Clearly, this is not a before and after picture, right? Uh, the guy on the left is white and older. And, and so what is this? What Alvin found what he needed to start a new life, but over 13,000 people in the greater Seattle area are homeless, many struggle with addiction. Okay, I'm not sure what that ad is about, except they were trying to raise money, but it drives the dominant narrative. Uh, so in the US, just to be clear, none of us can make a material claim on the human right to housing, or for that matter, any of the economic determinants of health. So we know the things that make people healthy. Housing is probably at the very top of the list. Education makes people healthy. Uh, all sorts of things. Um, having a decent income, um, being able to make choices about who you can be with and love, uh, having reproductive health rights, all these things. And international law does dictate some of these human rights, and yet we have no ways of actualizing these in the United States where we have no, really no social welfare systems. We don't have universal access to healthcare. Uh, it's, it's a sad country. <laughs> um, so you may have seen this book that came out, I don't know, a couple of years ago now, Greg Coburn, one of my colleagues at the UW, he's an, a professor of real estate. We actually have a department of real estate at the UW uh, named after a real estate company. Um, but he published this book, which explains why cities with higher poverty rates, curiously, don't have more homelessness. It's a thing you'd think, right? So why does Seattle have more homelessness than Detroit, which is a much lower income country, uh, city? So in fact, it's the opposite. Cities with lots of upper income people like Seattle and San Francisco have rent rates that price out poor people. Cities like Detroit have more poor people, but they have more affordable housing. And he does this analogy of, uh, a musical chairs game where, uh, you know, there's a certain number of chairs, which you could imagine as apartments. And uh, when the music stops, if you're the guy on crutches, you're not going to scramble for a chair, right? And so if we want 
people to be housed, we need to provide more housing. There's, there's a news flash, right? But he explains it in this wonderfully clear, straightforward way that I think has been helpful to, to the dialogue on all of this. So just to bring Marx into the conversation, a little socialism always helps this go down. Um, so Rosa Luxemburg argued uh, that the problem is something called underconsumption, a general lack of sufficient effective demand for products to soak up the growth in the output that capitalism generates. So we make all this shit, right? Some of it is completely unnecessary, but is generated to make profits for manufacturers and the owners of production. This and a, and a crisis arises because workers are exploited and by definition of surplus value receive much less value to spend than they produce because capitalists are at least in part obliged to reinvest a little so they can't buy and certainly have no need for all the products their companies produce. They need some working class people to buy all this stuff which requires them to pay more wages than they're willing to pay them. So we have all these goods in the marketplace that we don't have enough income to buy, uh, and it creates this problem of overconsumption. All right, this leaves people unemployed or underpaid, which leads to homelessness. And more and more homes are getting into the hands of wealthier corporate distant landlords. Um, limited liability corporations are now the dominant landlord in many cities, including here. Uh, it, this was a story in February 2022. Last year, investors bought nearly one in seven homes sold in America's top metro areas, and the most in at least two decades. Um, so this buying spree is driving up prices and fueling homelessness. And all these LLCs use a, uh, a software algorithm product that just routinely drives up rent constantly, um, which leads, of course, to the inability to pay rent, which leads to eviction. Um, and so during the pandemic, we had this amazing relief from eviction because we saw that it drove up the, the spread of COVID. And so there was a COVID, there was a eviction moratorium driven by the CDC of all places, God bless them. Uh, they actually noticed what was causing poor health in the marketplace and did something about it. Um, but of course, all those uh, moratoriums were ended. Uh, the Supreme Court nationally ended the moratorium in August of 2021. And in many jurisdictions, uh, they extended it beyond that national deadline, including here, but that's now all been abandoned. So there is evidence, though, that th those moratoriums really worked, that people were much healthier with the moratoriums in place. Uh, but of course, city council in 2022 uh, retired that moratorium. So Seattle conducts a whole lot of homeless displacement operations. Um, Parks Department, police, all sorts of city agencies collude in removing people living outdoors from where they are trying to set up camp. And for a while, the city kept really good records of these sweeps on the website, and we have harvested this data. It's no longer up there. You can't find it there anymore. Um, but we an we've analyzed it some and uh, done some good work sort of mapping all of this. And as you know, the question of sweeps is now before the, the US Supreme Court. So sweeps are these really highly invasive activities. Here's the park department sweeping a park near my house. Uh, when was this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have the date on this. It's probably at least a year ago. Um, here was a uh, sweep of Echo Park in Los Angeles in November of 2020, so sort of the height of the pandemic. Um, and many people say the city of Los Angeles wrote the playbook for sweeps. Here's a raid 
on the encampment at Echo Park where my son lives uh, during the winter of the pandemic. Here's an eviction. <clears throat> Again, my son took this picture. Uh, he's part of a team in LA that does uh, witnessing of evictions to support the victims. Um, these are really ugly affairs as, as illustrated in this photo. Private security guards are authorized by the sheriff's office and they engage in the public humiliation of removing people and their belongings and their children from homes uh, <clears throat> in this way. And you may have noticed that just last week, King County Sheriff's Office deputies killed a person they were trying to evict in Auburn. And this sort of death is not uncommon. I went to the World Wide Web and typed in eviction killings and lots of reports come up from all over the country. So the counter narrative to the capitalist approach to housing is that housing is a human right, a premise promoted by the UN Special Rapporteur on Right to Housing. The UN Center for Human Rights publishes uh, fact sheets and reports re-emphasizing the right to housing uh, and updating what we know about uh, homelessness worldwide. So <clears throat> international law requires that people be given housing. It's just that there are no states that do really, very few. And downtown S Seattle is looking a little apocalyptic these days, don't you think? So various agencies and organizations working work on enumerating the size of populations in various categories of homelessness and displacement. This is uh, where we can talk about what displacement and homelessness looks like in occupied Palestine territory. But um, so the UN says there might be a billion people worldwide without housing, although they really enumerate only about 150 million. Um, so, you know, some of these are refugees, some are just destitute poor. <clears throat> Seattle has vigils uh, every month. You've noticed the women in black vigils on the city council steps. Um, and these were based on the women in black movement in Israel founded by left-wing Israeli women who opposed the occupation and the deaths it produces. Um, so, you know, th this goes back decades. Uh, here's a photo of the Seattle women in black uh, vigil on the city hall steps. Um, at least 380 homeless or temporarily housed people died outside or in public or by violence in 2023. And already this year, we're at 117. So we're on track to uh, maintain our rapid death rate of homeless folks in Seattle. But homelessness in Palestine looks different from how it looks here. When you go, walk down the street in any Palestinian city, you do not see people looking like they do in downtown Seattle. Um, there are no tents on the sidewalks. There are not people sitting with a piece of cardboard and a cup collecting money. That's not what homelessness looks like there. Homelessness in Palestine is a political project, not an economic failure. Um, <clears throat> And yet its origins and features are at least as violent and humiliating. So to understand this, we have to understand settler colonialism where you know, the occupying country, Israel in this case, replaces the original population of the colonized territory with a new society of settlers, which is what's happening in the West Bank. And, uh, cities like East Jerusalem. Um, the US, of course, showed the world the way how to conduct settler colonialism as we displaced indigenous people in the United States with white European immigrants. Uh, in the US, we do sweeps to eliminate homeless people. In Palestine, it's displacement. Israel, for more than seven decades, has welcomed Jewish settlers from around the world, including the United States, to engage in a massive displacement of Palestinians from their homes. 
This is residents of the Janine refugee camp fleeing their home as the Israeli military pressed ahead with a siege on the area in July of 2023 while I was there. I didn't take this picture though. So the whole idea uh, of selling, the idea that Israel could be a caretaker for this land is that this was a land without any people and, and Jews displaced from the Nazi Holocaust needed a place to go to feel safe, to, to have as a homeland. Um, and somehow the European powers landed on this piece of territory uh, and handed it over without any due process, any idea of how uh, the indigenous people would have any agency or access to democratic processes. Um, there are two disconnected territories comprising Palestine, which are Gaza and the West Bank. And by the West Bank, we mean this side uh, of this territory where um, uh, it's the West Bank of the Jordan River, which is on the west side of Israel. Um, so, whoops, sorry. So West Bank and East Jerusalem are occupied territory. Um, and this is what displacement looks like in those places. Um, these are settlers just taking over somebody's home in a Palestinian neighborhood. And it's very aggressive and it's very humiliating. And, you know, I think one of the things we don't fully appreciate is the role of humiliation in the attack on Palestinians. And it's such a powerful force and so hurtful. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture I took as we were touring um, uh, just outside Tel Aviv. Um, Israel, of course, is a small country uh, and Palestinian territory is even smaller, of course. Um, strong family ties and extended families exist. Um, Palestinians had a long tradition of expanding their dwellings as families grew. Here's an example of that. Ensuring everybody would have a home. There's no visible street homelessness. And uh, so when homes are lost to settler land grabs, people double up with extended relations in even further away places. So you can see the architecture sort of reflects this. It's sort of cobbled together and added on and so on. Israel has conducted many assaults on Gaza over the last 15 years, demolishing houses, destroying life, sustaining infrastructure and displacing people. And over the last month, of course, we've watched yet another effort to eradicate Palestinian population and their homes. Not just month, months, seven months. So there's this idea of domicide, destroying people's homes. Um, and NPR recently popularized this term with a story on what is domicide. Um, and in this story, they commented more than 650,000 residents of Gaza will have no home to return to once Israel completes its military project, according to the UN. And here, uh, The Guardian also talks about domicide uh, as a weapon of war. This is just to show us the current body count, uh, 36,000 people, Palestinian fatalities. Uh, nearly 2 million people displaced, um, over a million people feeling catastrophic levels of food insecurity, and just a lot of general destruction. Um, more of that. Uh, so there's this thing called the Absentee Properties Law. It was passed in 1950 in Israel. It regularly inspects, uh, authorities regularly inspect whether Palestinians are actually occupying the pro properties they own. And it's been used to confiscate homes in Jerusalem and other territories in the West Bank. This law has kept people from traveling, taking jobs in other places, or even marrying people who live elsewhere. 
Confiscated properties are given to Jewish Israeli settlers by various state officials, uh, including the custodian of absentee property. Um, it started doing this in 1948 and then uh, in Jerusalem, and then it has expanded this law to the remaining areas since 1967. Um, when I was there, this was playing out. These are my photos. Um, so Israeli settlers seized the family home of Sublaban, the, the name of the family, in the old city in Jerusalem after breaking into it under the protection of Israeli forces and forcibly evacuating uh, the family from its residence. Um, and then when they gain access, they fly their flags from the windows to just further humiliate everyone around. And then once the courts awarded the property to the new settlers, um, <laughs> the court also ordered the family to pay the cost of its own displacement. Just. There's another headline on that we can go find. Just astonishing. Um, so in the US, the dominant narrative is that homelessness represents unwise individual life choices, such as being born into a family that isn't wealthy. Here's a tip, don't do that. <laughs> uh, but in Palestinian territory, by contrast, homelessness occurs when homes are bombed or stolen by settlers. So two very different narratives about what causes homelessness and uh, then how it looks as it manifests. Uh, and just like resistance to sweeps by US homeless populations and their allies, Palestinians don't go quietly into the shadows. They use the law when they can. They also rebuild after demolition and are attempting to build an international resistance movement. Uh, and here, displaced families in these photos are going to their ancestral lands to conduct weddings and other family celebrations just to maintain ties with their roots. Here's a flyer that uh, comes in my inbox every month from the Women in Black in Seattle. Um, there's also, uh, I wanted to share with you that the American Public Health Association has adopted a policy on homelessness that opposes raids on homeless encampments or sweeps uh, nationwide. Um, and I'll just say that the resistance to displacement and homelessness is what I find most inspiring, uh, both homelessness and what's happening in Gaza now. I think um, the creativity of resistance and and the way it manifests in such inspiring, brave ways is is a thing to behold and to hold up. And I'm so proud of the young people in our country right now who are doing this work. Um, so this was a photo from uh, our own encampment at the University of Washington. And of course, people know about Rachel Corey, uh, who was the Evergreen State student who uh, died 21 years ago now, uh, trying to defend a home from an Israeli bulldozer, and she was crushed by the bulldozer. So again, that was a homeless defense activity. Um, you noticed last weekend, there was a 25-mile march across the city of Seattle. Uh, uh, in solidarity with the people of Gaza. Uh, and 25 miles is the length of the territory of Gaza. So they were replicating that experience. So the human right to housing is meaningless without the means to ensure it. Uh, building resistance to settler colonialism and unregulated capitalism is really the only solution to homelessness. We need solidarity mechanisms, family, community, and unions. Uh, and charity is not the solution. We need to really address root causes and change how power is distributed. And we need to connect imperialism, capitalism, colonialism, all those things that are large, giant concepts that are sometimes hard to sort of really clarify what do these things mean. 
and we may not know entirely what they mean, but we know what they look like. Um, and the Marxist term for overaccumulation is an internal contradiction of capitalism that creates internally displaced people of those made homeless by a failed economic system. This was a flyer uh, uh, encouraging, um, well, you'll recall we were displacing all sorts of encampments when the home run derby or one of those baseball things was in Seattle. And of course the, the really remarkable creative people in our city who work on homelessness made this lovely flyer and put it up. Okay. I was enjoying Jean's cat, so I thought I would share my dog. <laughs> She's sitting over here on the bed with me. So that that's what I got. So let's have some Q&A. Okay, thank you for that presentation. I've um, changed the chat settings so that you can drop your questions in the chat. And it looks like we already have a question from Amal. Go ahead, Amal. Oh, Amal, I, I can't hear you. Are you muted? I don't see her message in the chat, so. Oh, um, Amal had ra has raised her hand. Sorry, I still can't hear you, Amal. Hello. I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Oh, no. <laughs> it's breaking up, but it's OK. No, we can't. No. no. Whatever your no. microphone is, it's not working very well. Amal, would you like to type your question in the chat? Great. Great. Maybe somebody else could go and then we'll circle back. Yeah, I was going to suggest that too. I didn't see any more hands. Yeah. Nobody has a comment? Sydney. Sydney, okay. could you unmute and try to ask a question? Uh, yeah, can you, does my yes, sound? Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, for presenting for us today. Um, yeah, I found your I found your um, the information you gave us really insightful, um, especially about just kind of like the violence that goes into uh, both forms of unhousing people, um, but in different ways. Um, yeah, a slightly unrelated question. Um, as somebody who um, teaches at the UW, um, do you have any like insights or um, experiences with the recent um, encampment at the UW? Um, and um, like, do you have any information about like how um, how you felt about the quote unquote resolution? to that encampment? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, given the proliferation of bad examples of how university presidents can handle uh, protest encampments uh, across the country, uh, you know, it's such a low bar <laughs> to manage to 
I think we had a successful encampment. It lasted a month. Uh, it attracted 150 tents. That was how the count was made, the census. Um, and students had important, meaningful demands. I think the most important of which was to divest the UW from Boeing. Um, uh, the university, of course, did not agree to that but did agree to offer some scholarships to Palestinian students. Um, and we'll mm -hmm. see if those get delivered on or not. Um, today at 2.30 is a faculty Senate meeting that I will attend via Zoom uh, to discuss a divestment um, motion that's on the faculty Senate floor, which I'm really crossing my fingers will pass. It's always hard to know whether to put forward measures like that because if they don't pass, it's really bad. If they do pass, it's really good. So we'll see what happens with that. We've been working to lobby our faculty senators uh, on this vote. Um, so I think the encampment was a success in many ways. It built a wonderful community. Uh, it was home to some good conversations, uh, people had, uh, you know, Friday night suppers, um, prayer uh, exercises, um, talks. Uh, it, was, it was a good exercise to do. Did it accomplish what we'd hoped? Certainly not, um, but the two assaults on the camp were unsuccessful. There was one by the Charlie Kirk group and one by the um, Zionist project in Seattle. Um, and neither of those were successful, largely, I think, because so many university faculty and uh, non-encamped people showed up to help with the defense. Um, and that was an important way of demonstrating the power of those who were encamped. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and uh, just a little bit of hope with a uh, uh, Senate vote that's happening. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Amal has sent me a question that directly. So um, I, she was just asking about if you know anything about Israeli homelessness, if that exists. Oh, I don't think so. That's a good question, but I'm not aware of any. Yeah. And, then, uh, and Kano says, I've heard the term stochastic terrorism used to describe the recent murders of unhoused folks in Seattle. Terrorism motivated by online instigators who can elude responsibility. So like Change Washington, in my opinion, they're not unnamed. Is stochastic terrorism also part of how the occupation displaces Palestinians or would another framing of that violence be more appropriate? Well, I mean, certainly in Israel, the dominant narrative is inescapable. Um, and so if stochastic terrorism is specifically online, it, you know, in Israel, it doesn't need to be online. It's just everywhere. My friend, my, I, I don't know if anyone noticed, but during the, I think it was last November, um, as Netanyahu was busy targeting hospitals in Northern Gaza for bombing, there was a sign-on letter by Israeli physicians to Netanyahu, prime minister, saying, it's okay with us if you bomb hospitals in Gaza. 100 Israeli physicians signed this letter openly with their names, no, no hiding behind anonymity or anything like that, 100 of them. And I read this not... At first, it wasn't in a normal news source. And I said, that can't possibly be true. Somebody's just being ridiculous. And so I wrote to Osama and said, is this really true? And he said, oh, 
it's not only true, some of my colleagues at my own hospital have signed this letter. And I mean, to me, that was just the most shocking thing I can imagine. Imagine a physician saying it's okay to bomb a hospital just because people are not of your ethnic group. So I don't know, I haven't heard this stochasticide question. And, if, and I would just say, I don't think, I think creating the dominant narrative is not just an online project. Um, there is a question from a student who's listening with Kano that I'll bump up to the top. Uh, it says, with the overpowering insidiousness of the Israeli dominant narrative, how can we find solidarity with the Israeli working class, such as the original women in black? What could escaping the dominant narrative in Israel look like? Well, I think there is a very small left wing movement in Israel and those folks are, of course, remarkable for what they're trying to do. Um, I'll say that people in Gaza are well aware of the student movement here and the encampments and the bravery of students standing up to police and to attackers at UCLA, at Columbia. They know this is happening and they really take courage from it. And so I'd say more of that. We just need more direct action, more marches, more encampments, more all of this. Um, at APHA, I spoke about APHA and the statement we adopted last year on encampment sweeps. Um, APHA also in November of 2023 adopted a very brief statement uh, calling for ceasefire and, and more aid, which was also a project driven by young people in the association who showed up to the governing council and stood all around the room uh, advocating for this point of view. And it, and it was very controversial. There's a strong Zionist streak within APHA, sadly. Um, and uh, this year we had to resubmit a statement so that it would be reinforced um for the coming year because it was a late breaker last year and the statement we submitted has now been formally rejected by the executive board and we've been told it will not be allowed to go forward um i just want to show you some i'm going to share my screen again if that's okay i want to show you some photos um from oh that's not what i want let's see Let's see, basic, okay. I wanna show you some photos from that scene. So this was the governing council at APHA last year. And uh, this is the executive director of the association. Um, and these were all people lined up in support of the ceasefire resolution. Uh, and they got it to pass, which by 90% even, it was just a shocking victory to me. And it will be shut down this year. It's not going to be allowed. And we'll see what happens, what sort of resistance people are going to put up. I'm going to guess they won't go quietly. Within APHA, in the International Health Section, which I'm chairing this coming year, um, there is a Palestinian Health Justice Working Group, which brings together all the people in APHA who want to work on these issues. I mean, in general, Organizing on this issue is just like organizing on any issue. You need to bring together like-minded people. You need to think strategy. You need to think what the message is. You need to think who the targets are and bring people together to accomplish this work. So it help, help us with the next question. Yeah, well, I just wanna just point out that to um, some discussion from Deepa in the chat. Um, she shared that when she was in Israel, Palestine in 2010, she noticed unhoused asylum seekers from mostly folks from Eritrea and Sudan, um, and also shared an article um, about the conditions for asylum seekers in Israel. Um, oh, I believe you. And then there is another question from Liz 
Um, do you have recommendations for best first steps for organizing and forcing change to systems that cause and perpetuate homelessness in our community? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> would you read the question one more time? Sure. Um, do you have recommendations for best first steps for organizing and forcing change to systems that cause and perpetuate homelessness in our community? Yeah. So again, like all organizing, uh, you need to join an organization. So right now, it's the House Our Neighbors group are collecting signatures on the funding mechanism for social housing. There's a thing right now to do. Um, there's a King County Coalition on Homelessness, uh, Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness that has a monthly online meeting that you can join and hear what projects people are up to, what legislation we're working on, how we're going to respond when the Supreme Court ruling comes out, uh, authorizing or not authorizing encampment sweeps. Um, I would say also it's really important to follow the news. And, you know, locally that means, I think, reading the Seattle Times, also following Erica C. Barnett in Publicola. She's an important writer read the real change. Um, following the news is really important because the news on all of these is complicated. And all these decisions around homelessness are made mostly at the local level. So it requires following local news about this. And then when you follow the news, it will make it clear what the handles are for organizing. Stop the sweeps. I totally recommend stop the sweeps. All right, it is 1259. If there's one last lingering question, um, we could do one more or we can just uh, give Dr. Hagopian a big thank you and uh, wrap it up. It was such a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.